two liquids. Now, either one by itself, but mix them. I'd like to say never been to a police station where someone picked up an IED and brought it into the police station, uh, but unfortunately I have, and so that's pretty realistic. My name is Lloyd Davis. I'm a former British Army Ammunition Technical Officer. During my time in the military, I specialised in counter-terrorism hostage rescue bomb disposal or improvised explosive device disposal. I'm now a defence consultant and I also work with industry to develop uh, counter-EOD capability. And today, uh, I'll be reviewing some Hollywood bomb disposal scenes. One's old fathead shot got on that plane. Felt something depressed on my right foot. Pretty sure it's a landmine. His reaction in this particular case is, is very realistic of the kind of guy. You know, these are um, these are seals. They are incredibly professional, incredibly stoic. Now where do you move? Very minefield. What we saw there, that, that pile of rocks is, uh, is fairly realistic, particularly in Afghanistan where pressure plate IEDs were placed quite a lot. Um, so that's a little pressure plate buried in the ground attached to explosives to target personnel or vehicles. They would often be marked to uh, either warn the, the local population and they would mark them with piles of stones, rags, flags, that kind of thing. The issue I have is that's not how landmines work. There is absolutely no benefit in designing a landmine that works on uh, arming under pressure and then firing on pressure release. You know, what you're trying to do is, is initiate the explosion when that target is in the exact place you want it to be. And in this case, the exact place you want that target to be when the, the mine functions is directly on top of it. And it's a huge misnomer that there's this opportunity to um, stand on a landmine, stay perfectly still, and then work your way out of that situation. If you stand on it, that's, that's it, it's, it's going to function. Were he in this situation with his foot over a, a pressure plate, I think maybe they are in, you know, going about this the right way. They're probably limited very much in what their options are. So what it looks like they're trying to do is they've created two fixed points in the ground. They're going to tie a string between them to keep the tension down over that, that pressure plate. How they act, how they respond and stuff. Yeah, I can believe that. Um, but unfortunately, from the explosive point of view, uh, yeah, that's a zero. Okay, right now he's just diving straight in there, which is uh, it's probably not the best approach. Yeah, yeah. Of course you'd stroke it, that's fine. You know, when the British Army were working in Iraq towards the back end, the, the bomb suit itself was becoming tailored. We would only use the top half of the bomb suit, uh, mainly because of the heat uh, and exhaustion. You're going to be doing this for about 45 minutes to an hour um, in ridiculous heat. So you know, the, the, the bomb suit's realistic, that's fine. Approaching without using the robot first, probably less so. Really, you want to do minimal interaction with the bomb. So very rarely would you just start picking at things, moving stuff around. He's identified the, the detonating cord that's going into the main charge itself, which is an artillery shell. And he's trying to separate that detonator before breaking down the explosive train. So it's not complete rendering it safe, but uh, it's going to take that small pop which is still pretty dangerous, but it's not going to bring down the entire neighborhood. So fairly reasonable sort of uh, RSP or render safe procedure so far. Gotcha. So he's just pulling that, that detonator or blasting cap um, out of the, the fuse well. Absolutely no looking around to see what else it's connected to or what that wire might be doing. All right, we're done. Good to go. There are lots of guys watching, recording and filming what he's doing. Um, that's absolutely realistic. The bomb place is most likely going to be watching. So they understand what we do. Uh, got a wire. Hang yeah, and we don't do that either. We don't we don't pull up wires to see where they go. So this was actually really, really common in, uh, in Afghanistan and uh, particularly in Iraq. Um, they do what we call daisy chains. So they link multiple main charges, um, usually along the side of the road. And what he's doing there is he's pulling on the, the electric wires that are connected to the blasting cap that previously he just removed by hand quite easily. Now those shells are going to be somewhere in the region of 25 kilos upwards. Um, but he's now just, just dragging around and pulling out of the dirt, but uh, not something you want to be doing. We're going to see him run straight to what we call the firing point, which is the uh, the two bare wires on the wall. Oh, 
if this is a what we call a proxy bomb, so they'll probably have a handler. They'll probably have someone watching, uh, and there'll be two triggers to this particular bomb. There'll be the uh, the intended trigger, so a, a push button or something on the desk itself, something that they're carrying or maybe strapped into. There are most likely, particularly in Iraq, uh, the mobile phone threat was pretty high. So there'd be probably a, what we call a, an RC or a remote control uh, trigger attached to the vest as well for precisely this situation. Uh, and we'd call that a chicken switch. So if the, the bomber decided to chicken out, uh, his handler could detonate him at a moment's notice. Oh, man. The priority is separating the bomb from the person, not necessarily dealing with the bomb. So he'd be gone as soon as that's been dropped off. I can't get it off. I'm sorry, okay? You understand? I'm sorry. No! I'm sorry! No! Get down! Uh, as an EOD operator, you feel particularly responsible and uh, there is very little he can do. There's no point in uh, wasting his own life. <laughs> it's one of the more realistic um, Hollywood explosions that, that I say we've seen. You know, there was a, a sizable amount of uh, plastic explosive all over that guy. If you can double the distance between you and the device, um, you actually expose yourself to about a quarter of the, uh, the, the shock wave and blast wave that you experience. So any any foot he could have got further away from that would have, uh, would have helped. So the first scene we saw, for absolute realism, I'd give it about a two or three out of 10. For this scene, probably a seven. I remember watching this in the cinema and I happened to be there with some colleagues at the time, one of whom was actually tasked with being part of the team that would render safe improvised uh, nuclear devices and some of the others were special forces operators and uh, we all had a lot to say about this clip. The, the bomb itself is quite reminiscent of the, uh, the bomb in Goldfinger. There's a really weird mix of mechanical devices clicking around and going on and complicated electronics. You're particularly never going to get two timers, one mechanical, one digital, counting down at the same time. Turn this screw counterclockwise. Got it. When the time comes, cut the green wire. Do not cut it yet. Okay, we copy. Another thing is this this innate knowledge of, of the, the, the heroes to have a almost textbook-like understanding of the makeup of these devices and be able to say, oh, it's uh, this switch from this area, we're gonna do this. That doesn't happen, it's bespoke. There are certain things, you know, the, the generic makeup of how these things operate, you can't get around physics, um, but, you know, knowing exactly what color wire and, and things to do is, is just not believable, it's not realistic. <laughs> And on cutting that wire, he's built in the software to just slowly open up and expose the core of this device. There's absolutely no reason why the bomb designer would, would design that feature into this bomb. Even if you've managed to render safe the, the trigger mechanism, all of this, all right, there's still a huge amount of work to do to start taking that apart and get rid of the, uh, the actual radioactive element of this. You've got multiple devices all having to be cut at exactly the same time. You know, they're all synchronized. That just uh, that doesn't work. We've, we've tried cutting wires um, at simultaneous times with multiple people across different parts of the room um, or even on the same device if everything's linked. And, you know, we've, we've tried it in training. Um, there is just no way you're going to be fast enough to, to beat switches in an electrical system by cutting things simultaneously. I'll give it a, a two out of 10 just because the, the, the physics. We found this in a playground. This stuff is cutting edge. It's a binary liquid. A what? Yeah, it's, that's pretty common for uh, an EOD tech to completely geek out and get excited about the, uh, the device he's found or what he's been doing. I'd like to say uh, I've never been to a police station where someone thought they uh, picked up an IED and brought it into the police station, uh, but unfortunately I have. Um, so that's pretty realistic. Two liquids, either one by itself, but mix them. So yeah, binary explosives exist. Well, essentially any, any simple explosive mixture is, is two separate um, chemicals that just mix together. So in this case, he's mixing a, what would be a fuel and an oxidizer to make an incredibly sensitive explosive. Very high tech bomb, very impressive explosive technology. And you're definitely not gonna get that, that kind of explosion out of that small amount. This guy being a, you know, a, a serial bomb maker, um, they have existed in the past. You know, they, they probably will exist again. In a sort of large bombing campaign like that, uh, even Afghanistan and Iraq were there. The bomb maker will develop a signature. They will develop multiple bombs. And a lot of what we did in uh, particularly Afghanistan when I was serving there 
was try and gather evidence, um, be it forensics or uh, just bomb style. So the technology exists, so I'd give it a six out of ten. I'm trying to dive into the tub. I can't do it. Can't do it, man. His Why legs. Not? He's been on there for like 18, 20 hours. He can't even walk, let alone hop off the can. Okay, so so that's actually a really, really good point. His legs are probably numb. He's fatigued. He's dehydrated. He's he's scared. He's unlikely to be jumping up and running around anywhere anytime soon. He might, however, just faint and fall off the, the toilet. So I'd probably be physically restraining him and holding him in place at this point in time. Now what he's doing, Sergeant, is spraying this thing with liquid nitrogen. That should give you a good second or two before detonation. Covering something in liquid nitrogen to, to freeze uh, the switch in place. In theory, it's a mechanical attack. You're attacking the physical mechanisms of that switch um, and holding it in place. It's going to do nothing for the electrics. It's not a good idea. It would not be something we'd do against uh, an improvised explosive device like this. Uh, you have no idea what that extreme cold temperature is going to do, how the components are going to react to that. They're pouring it in the wrong place. The switch is going to be right underneath him. Okay, get him up, get him up. Let's go. Move. First of all, there's only going to be one person dealing with this. Yeah, bomb blankets, containment of explosions, it's all things we try and do. That is one sturdy toilet. I mean, the whole side of the house goes out, but that porcelain toilet stays intact. Um, he's probably better off just sitting on top of that rather than jumping in the tub. You know, at the very minimum, you'd expect his eardrums to rupture. All the soft tissues in his body, particularly his lungs and his bowel, are very susceptible to blast wave and shock wave. Um, essentially, you've got a really bad bruise all over those linings. There's lots of blood and uh, you can suffer from what they call dry land drowning, which is where all the, the blood vessels in the lining of your lung uh, rupture and your lungs fill, uh, fill with blood essentially over time. Um, or you get blast bowel, which is slightly less severe. Um, but essentially, it's the same thing. Your bowel starts filling with blood and you bleed internally. In training, I've dealt with a toilet bomb before. The probably weirdest place I found one um, was in a bathroom originally. By the time I got to it, the uh, the landlord had thrown it out the window, had been collected by the police and driven back to a police station. I'd give it one out of 10. I'm going to cut the blue wire. And my lads will wait. If I go in the wrong way, they'll know what to do. So there's so much about this that I really like. So I think his attitude and demeanor, doing what he's doing is, is perfect. The communication back and forth. So that, that reach back, as we call it, to uh, someone who's not under that pressure, someone who's got the scientific support and support of other people around them can think maybe slightly clearer or cooler than you are, um, is very realistic. Touch the blue wire. It's never going to be a simple um, red or blue choice. A bomb is going to contain at least seven components from a power source to your main explosives, your initiator, switches. It's never as simple, unfortunately, as red or blue. And if it is, um, you do a little bit more investigating before you decide to cut the wire. Um, and now there's one guiding principle when we're working this kind of job. Um, and if you say you're going to do something, you do it uh, for exactly that reason. If you couldn't explain it to your mother as to why you're taking that action, you shouldn't be doing it. Um, so you are 100% sure when you do anything as an EOD operator. No way that, that you swap between decisions or do something that you uh, or not do something that you said you're going to do. So the, the vast majority of IEDs that we've experienced in Afghanistan particularly are very, very simple. Uh, they're very simple, very simple electronics, uh, very simple circuits. If you, if you were to cut any of the wires, um, you've probably broken the bomb enough to make it somewhat safer. Without having done a full investigation of what you're dealing with, um, you generally don't start cutting wires and, and hoping and guessing. It. That's a very, very surefire way to make sure that you uh, you don't survive very long doing this job. He would never have changed his mind at that last moment. So unfortunately, I can't give it a 10 out of 10, but uh, I'm going to go with a pretty high nine on this one. I've laid out what you'll need. Okay, so you've got the, uh, the expo or explosives officer from SO15 Counterterrorism Police. Um, they're a unit. They exist, they're very good. Um, they are all ex-British Army bomb disposal operators who transferred over to work uh, for the police and with the police. And he's gonna let the uh, the hostage defuse his own bomb, which um, is probably his first mistake. He'd easily put that small tool bag on the robot to send that down to the hostage. I'm not gonna manage the one hand. We'll start by freeing your left hand. 
is holding down what they call DMS. Uh, it's not an abbreviation we use. Uh, in, in this case, it stands for dead man switch. And whilst that button may be very light to push, uh, you press a button for an hour um, and you're gonna feel some extreme pain in your hands. So he has taped his thumb down onto it already, which is something we would do. Quite lucky actually, that that, that bomb is pretty poorly designed. All the circuits exposed. That's a pretty generous bomb maker not to kind of just put a cover over all of that. That decision between is this a suicide bomber or is this the hostage? Maybe if you're entirely unsure and you, you're suspecting more on the suicide bomber lines, then yeah, maybe send the robot with some tools down and, and try and get them to start doing something to, to help out. In this case, it would probably be much more exposing the device, showing it to the, the robot, showing them the components. If there's other switches, as I say, mobile phones, radios, that kind of stuff on there, you wouldn't necessarily start getting the, the hostage to start um, taking the device apart as we're about to see now. Being sure to maintain pressure on the DMS trigger. <laughs> that particular action so far is what we call uh, mechanical blocking. Um, so you're, you're basically doing a, a very risky um, physical procedure, you're not interacting with anything electrically. Um, all he's doing is replacing his thumb with something to hold that button down in place. Before we leave what we call the ICP, the incident control point, uh, and make that manual approach, or in this case, start doing any manual actions, um, we have a 100% plan of what we're going to do. Uh... Yeah, no one's letting go of that, that switch. No one is confident enough that they're going to lift their thumb off that without uh, without any OD operator making them move it. There's a whole load of other things you'd get to before you went anywhere near that. And the last thing I'd do is trust the tape that's been on his hand that's covered in mud, blood and sweat. Okay, so this is where this scene goes even more wrong for me. You know, without any diagnostics or understanding what you're doing, trying to just jab electric um, wires into a, a circuit board is uh, a really bad thing to do with the bombs. This whole clock speeding up and, and things you know, doesn't happen. Um, you might do something and, and the best you can hope for is nothing happening. So I winced at this the first time I watched it and I had a lot of people text me asking me how real it was. So I'm going to give it two out of 10. Agent Stanley Goodspeed, Agent Trainee Marvin Isherwood initiated an exam of wooden crate. Hazmat suits, they're a thing, we use them in certain situations. Hazmat suits are designed specifically for these chemical agents. That's kudos to the bomb maker right there. I mean, to make a creepy baby doll that sprays sarin gas, this is not a learning opportunity. All your training is done in a training environment where there's no danger. There's enough C4 explosive and poison gas to blow the whole chamber and kill everybody in the building. It doesn't make sense it's got two main charges or two payloads you've got the sarin gas that's a, um, a a chemical warfare agent it's a neurotoxin um, and what that does is it, it paralyzes the, the muscles by blocking what's called ach um, and that's the chemical sort of messaging system between nerves totally deadly on its own there is absolutely no need to put enough c4 in there to, to blow up the room So atropine is a real thing. Um, atropine is the, uh, the somewhat de facto antidote to nerve agent. Um, you don't have to inject it directly into your heart. You generally go for a, uh, a large fleshy muscle area like your thigh or buttocks. 15. Great, he's now soaking uh, an electrically initiated IED with water. Generally a really bad idea. You, know, you have no idea what short circuit that's gonna create or what damage that's gonna do. Pearl's configuration, unfortunately, incredibly unstable. Yeah, so uh, an incredibly unstable, elegant string of pearls um, is a terrible weapon design. So that, that sits within a rocket. It's going to get launched by a booster motor and it's going to fly over the speed of sound or however fast this thing is going to go. Um, unfortunately, that's going to be subject to a lot of physics. And one of those, those uh, forces it's going to be subject to is setback force, where essentially the the acceleration of the rocket increases the g-force uh, of those uh, those pearls and they're going to get compressed against each other really really hard so pretty much instantly as soon as that thing launches those are all going to crack and you're just going to get melted vx spraying out this thing as it's flying along the cholinesterase inhibitor stops the brain from sending nerve messages down the spinal cord within 30 seconds but that's after your skin melts off 
That's fairly accurate. That's really how you feel it. Um, what you wouldn't get is the huge blistering and skin melting that you saw earlier in the movie. Fantastic movie, unfortunately not very realistic at all. Uh, not from an EOD or weapons design point of view. This guy sounds funny. Something's slowing it down. Yeah, I could have told you that. What are we going to do? It would take probably more effort than it's worth to set that up as far as a uh, as far as programming goes. If she's been sat there for hours typing that code out, I'd probably get the guy in the bomb suit to start typing the code for her, give her a bit of a rest, let her relax. Hi. Who the hell are you? Dove. James Dove. Uh, particularly in a hostage situation like this is possible. And one of the key things we try and do is, is build rapport. You've got to try and keep them as calm as you can. Yeah, you, you, you would strip down, you, you, you know, wouldn't, or remove the barriers as far as helmets and body armor and the likes to get on with this. You like red wine or white wine? I don't give a s***, do something! Red, me too. The truth is, we, we don't guess at anything. Um, if we don't know, we don't do it. So I'd probably go for a, a 2 out of 10 for this one. I, mean, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. You guys are the experts. Maybe you don't need me. This is, um... This is Semtex. Am I right? Plastique. Okay, so he's the, the disgruntled, um, unappreciated specialist. So far, he's identified some kind of plastic explosive as Semtex. I'm not convinced at this moment in time. But, you know, have I seen stuff laid out on a, a police table or in a police lockup that probably shouldn't be there and probably should have been dealt with? I, I absolutely have. What else do we have here? Oh, this is a, a, a plunger detonator, am I right? And that's a little mini receiver. He's talking absolute rubbish at this point. Um, he's waffling about uh, plunger detonators uh, and whatever else. Yeah, Ut utter nonsense. So for, for technical accuracy, um, that's that's basically a zero. 